Mexican immigrants would go to the, the U.S. to work to send money, money back to Mexico. Yeah. That was a phenomenon. And it still is. I mean, I'm not saying that we're at a zero as far as Mexicans crossing the border, but that's no longer a sentiment that you feel that much in Mexico yeah. of me going to seek a better life in the United States. That's not as common as it used to be. Different motivations for these current waves. Most, most of these waves are now uh, mass migrations caused by regional destabilization and insecurity versus people looking for opportunities in the United States to make a better life for themselves and their family. The opinions of the guests and hosts are their own and do not represent the opinions of Ironclad, the Border Patrol, or the Department of Homeland Security. We cut through the partisan talking points. We're not interested in perpetuating fear. We're interested in seeking truth, hearing what's really going on on America's borderland. Welcome to Borderland and Ironclad Original. My next guest is Ed Calderon. He is an expert in cartels and smuggling and so much more. Uh, he's infamous from his podcast with Joe Rogan. I think you guys have probably heard of him, but the knowledge he dropped on us on this episode, I think is extremely important for you guys, listeners to enjoy. Check it out. Welcome to the show, Ed Calderon. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, you're the infamous Ed Calderon. A lot of people know who you are. They've known some of your backstory. You've been on some of the biggest podcasts in the world. And uh, we've been communicating for, for a few years now. And I'm glad to finally be able to sit down with you and ask some questions and your expertise. Awesome. It's, uh, uh, I've been watching and listening for a while now. Uh, amazing podcast. I love the fact that we are getting to hear not only from on the host side, from people that have been on the ground and know some of these uh things firsthand, know what things smell like, uh, but also just having uh, like a platform uh, for people like us who uh, really want to, you know, share some of the stuff that is going on there and in, in in a perspective that comes from experience, not just from uh, seeing things from afar. So I, I agree. appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind for the audience who might not know you, the one or two out there in this world that's listening to this podcast, would you mind giving a quick bio? Uh, sure. Uh, I was born and raised in Tijuana, Mexico. I'm a, uh, I'm a, uh, I'm a child of the border. Um, that's where I got my English. If you don't know how to speak English in the border, you're pretty much screwed. Uh, grew up very Americanized. Uh, only had two channels on TV, um, Fox and um, and uh, Canal 12, right? So I, I got to grow up with Los Chavos del Ocho and uh, 90s era X-Men cartoons. You know, that was a pretty <laughs> interesting combination. Um, I... Uh, through some weird uh, happenstance and life uh, issues, I I had to get out of medical school and join a very experimental and uh, police force that uh, was originated in Baja. Uh, they basically tried to militarize and Americanize uh, a police unit in Baja, and uh, I was part of a very successful uh, counter uh, counter uh, cartel operation. Uh, on that border, um, under the command of a man called Lieutenant Colonel Izola. Uh, during that time, we we cleaned out Baja basically uh, for a bit. Um, it's it's been uh, cataloged as one of the only successful counter narcotic uh, regional counter narcotic operations in Mexico. Um, I had to leave that job in a hurry uh, a few years back. Uh, like everything, um, things change every five years down there, so I had to. Uh, from being uh, applauded, I was then under a lot of investigations, and a lot of us were. So we had to, we had to leave uh, quickly. Uh, I made my way to the U.S., and I've been uh, a citizen of this country for now almost six years now. Um, I wouldn't want to be in any, any any other place. It's a, it's an amazing country. That's great to hear. <clears throat> right now, before we we started recording, you were talking about some intel that you were getting. Um, do you feel comfortable talking about that right now? What's going oh, on? Oh yeah, because yeah, I I know for those who are listening, there was a you can explain why the the chaos is kind of happening now, but that's sure that's from the the recent apprehension of a high level cartel uh, official, correct? Yeah. So I I I have. Both I have I have still have contacts and and, and friends of mine uh, still work down there, uh, specifically in Culiacan uh, in Sinaloa, which is a very rowdy place right now. We just uh, we just went through the arrest, well the the apparent arrest of El Mayo Zambada, uh, a historical cartel figure 
who in over 50 years has never been arrested, uh, never been detained. Uh, we had very few pictures of this guy. This guy, this guy was a ghost. This guy was, he could have taught uh, uh, Osama bin Laden some lessons about hiding. Um, he was, uh, he landed in a, uh, on, on a small airfield in New Mexico near the uh, Texas border. Supposedly, um, he was, according to his lawyers, he was ambushed at a meeting in, in, in Sinaloa, uh, zip tied and betrayed by Joaquin Guzman, who is one of El Chapo's sons, and uh, handed over to the U.S. Uh, authorities. Uh, they put him on a plane and basically flew him over the border. Um, the, the veracity of that story is kind of suspect. Uh, there's a, a few theories out there that we can talk about later. Uh, but his, uh, his arrest has led into has led to to pretty to a pretty violent upscale uh, situation in, in, in Sinaloa. Um, this past weekend, they saw the, the murder of about 15 people that we know of. Uh, I just got some pictures of one of them. Um, there's uh, apparently a cleansing going on in 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 the region and a war, uh, an internal war war of the Sinaloa cartel. If people want to view the Sinaloa cartel, it's not a single cohesive entity. It's uh, small factions that uh, that are federal that form a federation of of, uh, of a cartel, basically. With El Mayo gone, a lot of the influences, um, a lot of the know how, and a lot of the power that uh, that that he had went with him. Uh, so now you're seeing uh, a cleanse, probably perpetrated by some of uh, El Chapo Guzman's uh, sons. Uh, but there's there's a clear uh, crack in the uh, in the system right now going on down there. Um, every everybody uh, is in hiding in one way or another, and, uh, and violence is roaring now. Um, it was pretty quiet after the arrest, but now you're starting to see some of the some of the stories of uh, what actually happened during the supposed uh, uh, abduction of El Mayo Zambada, and obviously who's who's responsible for some of this uh, apparent betrayal. Yeah, I was curious about it. I, th I thought there would be a lot more, I guess, news about this immediately. I thought it was going to be immediate kickbacks of deaths and, and internal fighting. <clears throat> and then currently on the news, we don't really hear that this is happening. Uh, you know, I, you're probably going to be one of the first ones to hear before most of us do. Um, yeah. but, but you start to kind of catch a buzz that things are happening. Now, when you say that there's a cleansing are they trying to look for who was involved in this? Is that what we're saying? Is that they're trying to see who was the I, corrupt individuals? I, I think I think if you if you see what happened and the, the lack of action after this uh, apparent arrest uh, abduction, you know, um, the confusion. Uh, people don't really know. Not even at at high levels within car, in some of these organizations that they know what what was happening. Um, uh, even the federal government in Mexico doesn't still know what's happening. Um, and they're actually very they're they're the most uh, nervous of all of them, I, I guess, because to operate in Mexico for 50 years, uh, putting drugs into the United States, you have to probably have some friends in high level government. And I'm sure he has those names in his head. And now he's currently in federal custody. So I, I imagine some of the uh, some of the federal forces in, in Mexico are kind of nervous. Um, there was confusion and paralysis after this uh, this news dropped, um, which is telling. Uh, which means that this was probably orchestrated and planned at a high level. Um, on one side, you have the Mexican government now trying to come up with treason charges for Joaquin Guzman Loera, who, according to the official narrative, uh, was the one that uh, ambushed uh, El Mayo Zambada, put him on a plane, zip tied him in, and uh, flew him over the border. Imagine that. Mexico is processing treason charges to this man that that should be very telling um, yeah that's insane we're, we're, i don't think the audience might not pick that up is is that one cartel boss is you know is more important than the other one is what the government is saying and they're actually calling treason on one for being in the assistance of apprehending this one that means that that individual has so much power tied into the federal government itself that they're so nervous about it they're trying to make actions to kind of almost save face that that's that's kind of the uh, that's kind of the deal there. And again, one of the biggest cartels in Mexico is the federal government. That, I mean, that's 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 a clear thing. And if anybody had any doubts about it, um, and when I say federal government, there's going to be a few listeners. And again, this this is all my opinion. Uh, 
there's going to be a few listeners out there who are from Mexico or probably have some sort of relationship to Mexico that, that are that are that are in love with the current administration uh, currently uh, down there. Uh, you can change whoever's in the presidency. It doesn't matter. Um, the line of corruption and power in Mexico has been clearly defined for the past 40 years now. And it doesn't respect and it doesn't give a shit who's in power as far as the presidency. We just went through a, an election cycle that uh, murdered many of these candidates, which is a clear indication that all of them were sponsored by one side or the other as far as cartels down there. Um, we're seeing... Uh, we're seeing a very nervous federal government. Um, we're seeing a, a weakened, a weakened Sinaloa cartel, which, in some ways, is good news. Uh, um, but in others, it's kind of like a. It, there's always power power vacuums that happen, and uh, being uh, being somebody that has experienced what it's like to take out one organized crime element that uh, is in control of a whole region. Look, I've, I've had that experience. Um, putting everything uh, in in place for them to be taken out. Uh, it's almost overnight that any underlings that had phone call connections or that kept a BlackBerry or that had a leisure is now the new guy. And it's almost sudden and immediate that uh, new new heads get get placed in, in, in power and, and things start growing up, growing again. And did that um, give the potential for other cartels like? CJG or whatever to gain more power, right? It's almost like a, a, a great the, opportunity the, for them. I mean, the one that the U.S. should be really worried about is the new generation cartel. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I know you've had people kind of talk about that same thing before. I can talk about it in a few ways. Um, a lot of the people that I used to work with, that's where they went to work. Oh, uh, so, these, so guys that you worked with, like trying to of, take out the some, cartel has turned around and now works for them. Some of the people in the past that I've worked with and 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 trained with and some some of these people went to training with me at least two training cycles in places like Coronado in San Diego um so some of these people that I used to work with that's where they went to work I mean these are highly trained individuals I've been currently doing training in the U.S. and every now and then I get questions like oh dude does everybody like down there know some of this shit it's like well some do you know some that were trained by Americans that then went down and had that experience down there um the new generation cartel is a threat, and it's it's a different type of organization. Now you just you just saw the destabiliz destabilization, and we're probably witnessing the disillusion of what was the Sinaloa cartel on one end. On the other, the federal government in Mexico was actually making an effort or an attempt to attack uh, and debilitate this new generation cartel, um, and has done so in, in the, for most of this administration. Because it's not on their side. Uh, federal government is currently seen a law cartel favored in a lot of ways. Um, so now you're seeing a destabilizing law cartel, which is not in the best interest of uh, Mexico's federal government. And having a Mayo Zambada in U.S. custody is, makes them really nervous. And on the, other end, on, the, on the other end, you're seeing the rival cartel grow. And now they have a clear path to a nightmare situation for the U.S., which is a segment of the border wall being controlled by new generation cartel forces. That's what we're all kind of looking at now. If that happens, now they have a clear corridor into the United States. This is a high... Yeah, why is that a threat? Uh, these are... Th this isn't the scene of all cartel. Uh, these guys are not about uh, being subtle uh, or about maintaining uh, appearances. They're overt paramilitary. Uh, they are one some of the only cart, uh, cartel organizations that have taken down helicopters. Um, they know well enough to get man pads to get around the threat of aerial assets uh, that the U.S. Uh, that the, Me the Mexican military could set up against them. Um, they're sophisticated. Um, they're sponsored. Um, during the uh, COVID epidemic, we saw a lot of the fentanyl uh, still being pumped into Mexico and up into the United States through these new generation cartel because they clearly have some sort of relationship with China. Um, they, they, they just act differently. Uh, we, we, we have seen them battle hardened in places like Michoacan, where trench warfare and drone warfare was going on before the Ukrainian conflict. Um, mm. it's, they're just a different animal. Um, uh, ghillie suits, uh, precision, precision shooting from long range, uh, IEDs, uh, 
tried tried and proven drone technology uh, being utilized as the for counterinsurgency type operations or, or, or warfare before the Ukrainian conflict. Uh, it's a threat. It's uh, these these are guys are you, you haven't seen something like that close to the border or in the United States before, and I think that's what might happen next. Yeah, when you say that, <clears throat> you know. The, the historically the cartel does not create chaos on the American side of the border because it would cause us to, and I'm talking on the law enforcement side to double up, triple up on our manpower and actually hurt their means of in, in, uh, insertion or, or, or smuggling drugs. There's almost seems like a, um, a not, not a public, um, agreements, but they don't cause harm to us on our side and on the borders. I'm saying affect our border patrol agents. They don't, there's no shooting across as much as you would think. There's, a, you know, there's not this massive, massive threat. And it feels like there's almost this, uh, like I said, an agreement, almost like a, like a, like this is you guys do your job. We do our job. If we get some by, you get some by. It is what it is. And it's kind of like this cat and mouse game. This, this new cartel sounds like they might not care so much about that kind of um, relationship. It, it's, it's layered. Uh, you have, you know, when, when, whenever you think about cartels and you see some of these online, you'll see these kids in the back of a truck with an AK, you know, and these are usually localized cartel forces that will, you know, operate in regions that they control and they can be overt about it and running around with AKs. What you rarely hear about is stuff like, uh, Dude walking out of a public park uh, into a car that's already waiting for him, going into that car, driving somewhere, shooting somebody point blank in the face with a 22 caliber pistol suppressed uh, after gaining some intel on him with trail cameras and then going back into that park and then just walking into the woods. This happened in the U.S. and this is this was done by one of the new generation cartel guys. This is sophistication. This is... Uh, this is training. These are some of the higher level uh, capacities of these 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 organizations. And again, um, these guys are more militarized. They have uh, current, active, battle hardened individuals that have gone through multiple conflicts in Mexico, and they have done a better job as far as recruiting and figuring out who's good for those types of jobs than the Sinaloa cartel. The Sinaloa cartel traditionally has recruited people from the state of Sinaloa. That's kind of like the Italian mob type uh, yeah. attitude to it. The new generation cartel will recruit whoever is useful. So it's a different. Jason Jones, we had on the show and he talked about that, how the new generation cartel, it, you know, there's the hit, there's hits and murders that happen here in the United States that are not documented as, and not attached to cartel, but they are. And so you're saying the same thing and, and verifying that, you know, it's it's probably so done under the radar that none of us are identifying it, but it's happening often. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and just having just an, another aspect of this that people kind of like you should know. Um, um, I went through forensic training through my through the through, through the police. Uh, when I say forensic training, I mean I know how to corner off like a murder scene. I know I know about ballistics. I know about fucking striations, and I know all about all about this type of shit. They don't. They do as well. They have a. They took the element of force multiplying that some of the Zetas took way back in the day, and had an. They will have individuals that know about some of this stuff and basically educate the uh, individuals. And the U.S. was looking for terrorist training camps somewhere in Afghanistan with the monkey bars. We well, have those in Mexico. All over, all over parts of the Sierra and some of the central parts of Mexico, where they're not only not learning, they don't do do monkey bars, but they will do long range shooting. Um, there's been a few mini guns out there that the, they, that we're already seeing being uh, installed in in technicals. So this, it's uh, again, it's a threat that is right under the nose of the United States, but we for some reason, well, until recently, with some of the stuff that's going on now, which I think. If you look at some of the issues that happened recently, the U.S. Um, arresting Omayo Zambada, which is, I think he probably, this is a retirement package for him. <laughs> That's my opinion. Again, opinions. I don't know. Uh, for somebody who's never been arrested for 50 years, you know, it's very suspicious on my end. I don't know. Um, you have two of his sons who are already under federal protective custody. 
I think this is a retirement package for him. Um, they sent him to New York, so I think they're going to probably utilize some of his, some of this as a political thing. Um, but you have this individual who was not only operating openly in Mexico. I mean, his his supposed ambush and arrest happened in a mediation meeting he was going to have between the governor of Sinaloa and one of the heads of the university there because they were having some sort of issues and that he was basically there to mediate. I mean, this is, this is bizarre. Um, you have somebody like him now in the possession of the United States and the U S is dead silent with its counterparts in Mexico. And it's supposedly an FBI operation, uh, which is kind of strange. Um, whatever this is, whatever this is, whatever wherever this is heading, it's not heading in a way where the federal government in Mexico is comfortable with. So we've heard the we've heard about designating cartels, terrorist organizations. We've heard of, on both sides of the of the aisle. And I think this is where we're headed. We're headed to we're headed towards a place where the U.S. is going to pro, we're, is going to start putting pressure on high level government in Mexico. Um, Mexico is going counter the U.S. It's it's uh, day by day. It's turning into a, a more of a Venezuela leftist type uh, institution. If if you if you look at it closely, uh, the DA has been kicked out of Mexico. <laughs> For for the most of this administration um, and uh, collaboration and, co and 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 conversation between both sides has been kind of dead and stale. Um, so I think this is where we where we're heading towards towards some sort of confrontation between both governments. Do you think? I mean, there's several questions. I want to keep going down this, but do you think that there's a chance that the U.S. government was involved in some capacity with the Sinaloa cartel, and so? Bring him back to the United States, like you said, is a retirement package, almost like this is how we save ourselves from the intel and this is how we save him from getting killed. Again, my opinion, just from seeing these the, these things at a ground level and also just uh, I worked at, at different levels uh, from federal to, to, to state to local in, in Mexico. And I got to listen and hear a lot of conversations and just the way things the, the way people thought about some of these cartels from from the past, uh, the Sinaloa cartel realistically is not the Sinaloa cartel. It's the Los Angeles cartel because that's where it was born. The Sinaloa cartel, as as an institution, as 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 it is now, was probably born somewhere in L.A. And a lot of the people that showed El Mayo Zambada, who is kind of the historical head of that cartel, um, how to do his business, were people that were operating during the Bay of Pig incident, um, CIA guys. Um, that knew well uh, well enough about arming uh, or, or arming uh, uh, paramilitary groups and moving things through the air on the ground and through the sea. Um, I get a lot of calls from this. <laughs> Keep this, going. This is this is uh, I mean this is this is historical knowledge. People know, know Mayo somebody that lived in L.A. Um, th this these are I've heard stories, and again th these are just stories that I've heard that during my time of the U.S. asking for aid during 9-11 when the attacks happened to secure the border. And some of those calls were placed to the Sinaloa cartel. The, the, like, I mean, when you talk about securing the border, you're not going to call the Mexican army to secure the border. They call the cartel. You, get, you call the cartels. And what, and, and that this is before my time. This is this I was in med school back then. But I, something I heard from the older guys is that you would see, uh, you would see a clear order from all boyeros or smugglers to keep on the lookout for Arabs, and that was like a weird telling thing that they wow. would have this uh, instruction, right? So, I don't know. In a lot of ways, it would make sense for the U.S. to have somebody like him, yeah, and also a, almost also protect him as he's getting older, saying it's probably time let's let's, let's bring him in. Yeah, he's and, he's uh, he has cancer. Um, I think he, I think he's diabetic. I'm not too sure about that. Um, uh, as far as like some of his medical, uh, I think he, I think they published his medical scans. But yeah, he, he looked older. He looked very thin. He, you know, he looked like he's sick. Yeah, he's a, he's a, his old guy. He's sick. His sons are already in the U.S. under protective custody. There's a 
a few there's a picture of one of them that I think surfaced uh, about a year ago somewhere in an airport in, in in Dallas, which is fascinating that he's just like really moving about. Uh, he has kids in the U.S. that showed up to his uh, his hearings um, during his, his first hearings. Um, so wh whoever he was, and again, this these are, this is all theory and just opinions. Whoever he was, he was very essential and important for the U.S. and the US, in U.S. interests. And it's interesting that he was the head of the oil cartel. Um, but now that he's out of the picture, at least uh, at least. Uh, as far as uh, decision making and, and movement in Mexico, now you're seeing a cleanse of all of his operatives in Mexico, and it's not too clear who's doing this cleansing. Um, some people might consider him, some people in in his own criminal organization might consider him a traitor, um, or it might be an internal war brewing, or it might be the federal government down there trying to clean <laughs> clean clean its tracks. Who knows? Um, it's uh, uh, but it's very clear that something is looming in the in the future for Mexico and the United States as far as a uh, some sort of confrontation. And again, I've I've been talking about some sort of military intervention in 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 Mexico um for the past three years now. Uh I said five years, three years ago, and we're on our way to we're the close. end of this. We're we're on our way to to something, I yeah. guess. Um how powerful the cartel is. You and I know this, and I'm not sure why a lot of people don't want to acknowledge this, but they definitely run Mexico. And like you said, it doesn't matter who's president. I know the next president coming on board has the same ideologies as the current president. So there, there looks to be no real change in how they approach the cartel. And so is there some kind of belief that the cartel is trying to get enough power to eventually legitimately take over the country i think we're already there i think we're already there uh the current president Andres Manuel lopez over there was visited sinaloa and specifically the hometown of el chapo guzman six times that we know of in this current administration which i don't there's nothing there of importance but el chapo guzman's uh mother uh mother's house and a bunch of tourists that want to take a picture in in, in the big sign that says like Latuna, right? Um, he's he, he's been there six times in his administration. One of these times, he basically went on record to say that we shouldn't buy Chinese drugs; we should buy locally made drugs oh, because shit. we're we should support the local fucking drug drug uh, de uh, dealers, I guess. Um, he shook hands with El Chapo Guzman's lawyer and mother, and like publicly he didn't give a shit about it. He was like he's a person too, and all that. So I think in a lot of ways, if, and also we just saw Maya Sambada supposedly ambushed during a meeting with the current uh, governor of, uh, of Sinaloa, who is teetering on maybe resigning after this whole scandal. Um, they were already, they were already uh, compromised or paid for, is what you see. Um, I think I think what's happening in Mexico, and I think we have to kind of like separate everything. There's political power. There's money that comes from old money in Mexico. At least most of it used to come from old money in Mexico that would influence elections. Um, and now you're seeing cartel money being funneled into this institution. That's why uh, candidates being assassinated on one end is increasing. And also on the other end, you're seeing um, this hands-off approach to cartels in Mexico with the current administration going, abrazos no balazos, like bullets, yeah. uh, hugs not bullets. Basically. Hugs not bullets, right? Um, and now you're seeing a, a federal administration wanting to put treason charges on a man that took Omayo Zambada across the border. Um, so you, you're seeing this. There, there's clearly there's clear indications of a cartel is not only having an influence, but also ownership over certain parts of the federal government. That's one end. And on the other end is the army, which is never talked about. The Mexican army and its um, it, it influence and power in Mexico. If you want to talk about one of the most powerful cartels in Mexico, you we have to talk about the federal uh, cartel that is the army. Really? Um, yeah. I you mean, know, you know, just a personal story. My parents went into was it Puerto Penasco, and my dad just took the wrong turn in the army pulled him over and freaking made him get out of the car, all this stuff. And 
he just heard a story about his own friend that did that. And they took him to a place. They made him get naked. They, you know, the women and everything. And then they took money from them. And my father was like, shit, I just heard about this. And he just put my own, you know, his wife and kids into that same kind of predicament. And, and I've always heard, you know, law enforcement out there is kind of corrupt. So, you know, you bring an extra hundred bucks in your shoe if you get arrested for pissing on the concrete or whatever the hell it is. Right. Uh, yeah. That's when you go party out there. But like what's turned into now, it's actually very intimidating and scary. And some of the interviews I've done with some of the, you know, um, migrants who've come across is that they're just as scared of the military that they are of the cartel because the military themselves are shaking them down and stealing them. And, and also are, are just in these interviews that they're also involved in raping and extortion of women too. And so the fear is not only the cartel that's transporting them and extorting them. It's when they have to run into the military next and it happens all over again. So the military will, will bump into a group of immigrants and hand them over to the local cartels. This is, this is documented and happens regularly. Um, we just saw the dissolution of the federal police in Mexico this in, during this administration. Like everybody like myself who went through a police academy, uh, went through background checks, uh, polygraph testing, all this shit, you know, and again, my institution that I was a part of, yeah, there was corruption in it. Um, every, like it's Mexico. There's a lot of the, a lot, a lot of these have uh, some of those elements in them. But now the army is basically fully in charge. They came up with this institution of the National Guard, which is was supposedly going to be a civilian-controlled federal police force. Uh, it's not. It's a, it's military controls it. It's federalized, and the army controls it. The army controls all airspace in Mexico now. So the fact that Elmira Zambada went out, uh, flew out of the country, you know, is it's it's a black eye for these guys as well. Um, all uh, all of the new uh, train uh, construction, like uh, the, the Tren Maya, and all this, all of this infrastructure being created across Mexico, uh, airports, all of these things are now federalized and are under control by the Sedena, which is the the army in Mexico, basically. And we had a recent, was it three years ago, uh, document leak, uh, kind of like WikiLeaks, but in Mexico called Guacamaya Leaks, which is very underreported in the United States. Uh, the people, I, I highly suggest people that are curious about this kind yeah, of look into I'm the Waka Maya leaks. Definitely check it and out. It's basically uh, documents from Sedena, from the army itself, where they they themselves will say, hey, this region of Mexico where the army operates supports this cartel, and this region over here supports this other cartel. Um, this governor here is a cartel operative, but he is part of the current administration, so we're not going to fuck with him. But this guy over here is from the other party, so let's fuck with him over here. Um they detail basically what everybody suspects that they know certain people are working for certain sides, but they just choose not to act against them um, for political or for whatever reasons. And uh, we also just saw the release um, the of a high-ranking general, uh, Cienfuegos, who was basically one of the highest-ranking generals in Mexico in the past administration, being detained and arrested under cartel charges in the United States. You had the president of Mexico petition for his release, saying, hey, you uh, just drop the charges on him, send him our way, we'll prosecute him in Mexico. Just do us this favor. They did, and as soon as he got uh, on Mexican soil, they drove him to his house. And this is somebody we have on phone, uh, the U.S. at least has on phone, talking to high-level cartel uh, members. Um, it's... it's uh, it's one of the elements to this this uh, this this war that doesn't get talked about a lot. And again, I I worked with the army uh, many times uh, in Mexico, and I got to see both sides of the the shadiness, and also the their 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 the, the, but there are some great people there as well. I got to see the, the 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 driven side of them, and some of the not so driven side of them as well. Um, it, it but they've changed. I mean, the power that they have behind them now, I think. Um, they're the true power behind the throne in Mexico, not the cartels, the army. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think they have probably gotten into business with some of these organized crime institutions in, in, in regional ways where they're now working collaboration in some place, in some parts. Um, this National Guard unit that just uh, was originated, I, in my opinion, is a farce. Um, Federally, arrests have gone down, so either they're doing a great job or they're not doing their job, uh, which I think they're probably not doing their job. And 
cases of them basically harassing, extorting, and doing way worse things to the citizenship of this country, uh, of Mexico uh, have gone through the roof. And like some of the stories that you say, probably Guate Nacional was the one that was involved in that. Um, it's it's a dire situation. And again, who do you turn to uh, if you're the United States trying to look for uh, inroads of collaboration or work? Uh, who do you turn to? Um, the current administration, the current Biden administration, and 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 what could be the next administration with Harris, are not friends of the Mexican government. They're completely right now in in um, they're in conflict. Um, whoever comes next, as far as an administration, like whoever wins this next election, might kind of like tell us where this is going to go. But if it keeps going on with this current political trajectory, which is very much confrontational and silent, which is kind of scary. Uh, I think we're, 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 we're in for some sort of conflict at the border. What I found interesting in the past three years, four years, whatever, is the almost neglect of what's happening on the border. And I'll say it that way, the neglect as in like almost this passive like, oh, yeah, the border crisis, but no real actions being made that have been effective. And also seeing this kind of loophole asylum claiming asylum system that turns into still uh, allowing entry into this country without any kind of deeper investigation onto the individuals or whatnot, right? So just on that alone, is is there a threat that we should be worried about uh, with... Uh, yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I'm, from, I'm from Tijuana. Uh, it's my hometown. Uh, every now and then I get a lot of criticism because I talk disparagingly about Mexico and I wish I worked for the tourist industry so I can talk about some of the beautiful places in Mexico. Um, I... I make it a point to talk about a lot of specifically in my hometown. And I actually have a podcast myself that I film in Tijuana. Um, and I probably put prove a point around it. It's like, I'd hey, love to come there with you one day. You're more than welcome. We just, uh, just had Ed, Eddie Gallagher on. We had a few, a few people just come down and eat tacos and we'll show them around the city. Um, it's one thing that's very clear down there. And I think, uh, I've, I've taken a few reporters uh, around and, and 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 kind of seen some of the some of the situation down there. I took uh, I took Sean Ryan to one of the uh, the immigrant uh, camps uh, right on the border, um, which is funny as hell. Be I think he took a video of it. I have a picture of it somewhere. It's uh, this this one of the migrant camps right on the border and had a giant Biden flag in the middle of it, which is pretty hilarious. Uh, we handed out a bunch of uh, Make America Great Again hats to those guys. They didn't know what they would say. It was pretty funny. Um, but uh, you saw you saw within this group of people uh, stories that, that were pretty interesting. And you would see reporters come down from news agencies in the U.S. that would kind of ignore those stories. They wanted to, the human the human experience, but they didn't want to hear about the uh, you know the fact that they didn't want the uh, North Africans staying with them in that camp because they, you know, they didn't want those guys there, uh, and they would stay somewhere else. Uh, they wouldn't talk about uh, the Russian and Chinese uh, uh, immigrants that would show up because they would stay somewhere else. Um, they wouldn't. They they would not only stay somewhere else. They would stay like in housing. So somebody clearly with money from China is providing a pipeline uh, from Mexico up into the. Uh, up into the U.S., right? And if you know anything about intelligence, uh, Chinese intelligence is basically everybody in China is part of the Chinese Chinese yeah. intelligence organization. So, I don't know. I I I I, I do a lot of. Uh, I'm very traumatized. I've been through a lot of shit myself, so I'm very observant. And when I see some of these uh, young Chinese military age individuals walk around in cadence without swinging one of their arms, you know, the right arm. It's suspicious. I don't know. Maybe maybe they all went through military training out there. It's like an obligatory thing in China. But I don't know. It's weird. Um, you see a lot of uh, strange occurrences of people being caught with uh, fake Mexican IDs who are clearly Arab uh, or of Arab descent. Really? Um, and uh, some of them would documentation that comes all the way from spain like they were clearly being moved into mexico yeah like a strategic approach to do it yeah so. and in the past you would have the u.s would have people 
that knew a little bit about this stuff on the border, like uh, myself or some people that used to work, work in our liaison unit and would have an open line of communication. We're like, hey, I know how to speak English. And also you, you a bunch of you guys showed me what to look out for. Um, this guy looks weird. He's from he's an Egyptian guy and he has this fake documentation. Do you want to know about him? I guess that doesn't happen anymore. There's nobody like us anymore on that border. There's nobody who's going to be like, oh, look at these guys are weird. Let's see if we need to tell somebody about it. It's silence now. So it's basically it's free for all on that border. Yeah, we had a, a gentleman on here named Corey who lives on the ranch down by Ukumba in San Diego. And he collected over, I think it's close to a thousand uh, Chinese national documents from ID cards to passports. Just discard you, you, you them. Don't- you dump them. You have to dump them uh, because they could they could tell people who you are. Um, it's it's uh, I used to I used to find them in Tecate, like burn piles. It's basically people burning their documentation, just sifting through some of these. These are, you know, Tunisian passports, uh, the weird Egyptian ones, uh, uh, just anywhere in the Middle East. You would see North Africa. Um, but the the alarming thing is the volume. Uh, specifically the volume recently. Yeah. Um, back when I was active uh, six, seven years ago, uh, you would see, you know, small groups of people walking in in, in, in line, uh, dressed in camo maybe, uh, making an effort to hide, you know, having yeah. these black uh, these black uh, water jugs and everything and, and, and carpet shoes. They don't give a fuck now. They just fucking just march and information yeah. and just uh, and masses um i think that's what they figured out and it on the cartel side it's christmas i mean they're they're taxing every single one that yeah. goes through that border yeah fence. the so, statistics have shown that they're making more money transporting bodies than they are drugs anymore and so yeah. it's more prevalent to see bodies coming across and i say bodies as in humans right human trafficking human smuggling whatever you want to deem it but yeah, so there's more money right now currently what they're doing with with humans than it is drugs. Yeah, and, and speaking to look, I, I got to speak to one of them probably like five, four or five years ago, just right at the start of this like the the car- caravans, and he was saying like, uh, yeah, like the 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 whole build the wall uh, Trump uh, phenomenon that we saw was like amazing for them because it they even with the heightened border security, they could still put people through the ways they had in the past. Yeah. So they only made the perception of it being more expensive. Yeah. One. I, one. I interviewed Luis Chaparro and he was like, yeah, the cartel wants Trump to win because it brings more money to them because the, the notion or the idea, the perception, yeah, the perception of it'll be more challenging to cross. People are willing to yeah. pay more because they, they, they want to make sure they gain access. And so, yeah, and 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 the uh, crossings did drop, and then these uh, mass waves of migration started hitting the hitting the border. Uh, but you, you, he he told me he was like, "There's different ways we make money. Um, one, you know, we'll tax you if we have if you have to cross through our territory. Uh, we'll tax your family who was already on the U.S. side, and." If you're stupid enough to tell us you have family on the U.S. side, we'll tax them. And if you're really stupid and you give us a lot of details about them, we'll open source information, those fuckers, and see how much money they actually have. And we'll ransom you off. That's another way they make a shit ton of money. Like I've like this guy told me he made 25 grand off of this kid from Puebla who was who was going to cross um, the, his uh, his his. Uh, Parent, one of his parents, I think, who was already in the U.S., had to sell a truck to get him get him out, basically. And they didn't call the FBI. <laughs> they didn't call anybody. They just fucking just sent fucking money. Um, so that's another way they make money. And also just the trata de blancas. Uh, hey, uh, they'll have women with them who will recruit. And if they if it's somebody that's young enough that and pretty enough that they can utilize. They get grabbed. Um, what did you and call taken that? somewhere else. Trata de Blancas. Uh, Who's that translate basic, to? Uh, so basically looking for people that can be tra- sex trafficked, basically. Yeah. Um, so you, so that they're on the board. They're recruiting. Uh, you, you, and you, you know, you go separate. <laughs> 
And then when you go to the U.S., they get to sent to a hotel room um, yeah. or to a house somewhere and they start getting Sexually the grooming. They, they, they start getting groomed. Or, and it's always it's always women around them, you know, because that's that's the it's not dangerous here. There's women here. So polleros or like human traffickers actually set up these whole this whole system now where they have women with them to. Yeah, it's safe. It's safe. You're like a woman saying it's safe. Come and come oh, here, wow. you know. So that's another way they make money. Um, and also just the endangered servitude aspect of this. Hmm. And you can't pay now. You cross. You go and work in one of these um, immigrant uh, uh, facilities where they you hire some, some, some illegals. And you have to pay off a debt there. Right? So, you know, we, we talk about a lot about uh, slavery in this country, <laughs> our history with slavery. And we have current modern day endangered slaves that look and have the same skin as you and as you and I have uh, in, in the United States right now. Uh, some of them were working for Gavin Newsom in California during COVID as essential workers <laughs> at his, at his, uh, at his estate and restaurant. Um, wow. You, 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 you have modern day slaves in, in, in the U S and you know, it's, it, and it's, it's it, again, it's, yeah, it's complex, very complex. You know, I want to go back to the conversation about Mexico and the relationship with America. Is there ever a potential for war between both countries? Uh, and there's kind of a a kind of a weird war happening now. But the 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 idea I have, someone who's been to combat, someone who's highly trained, what is the capabilities of the Mexican military or cartel? Is there a, a, a real threat to be to be worried about? Um, so again, these are opinions. Uh, these are theories. These are also conversations that I've had with high level military people in, in Mexico, including some of the members of their special forces units, which I got to train with and work with a few times, uh, during my time down there. And some of them are retired now and some of them have YouTube channels, uh, and some of them talk about some of the stuff online, uh, with a mask on, but they talk about it. I have, um, I have a couple of their contacts. I'm trying to get them on. They're, they're pretty interesting people. If 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 it's who we if it's who I think it is, he's 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 a legit guy. And uh, the 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 perception in Mexico is one that there will never be an open armed conflict with the United States because of the effects it would have on the U.S. itself. So the U.S. is very much aware that Mexico is its number one trading partner right now. It used to be Canada, but we surpassed uh, Mexico surpassed Canada. Um, it's also clear to the United States that Mexico, it's on its way to become the new China. It has the industrial base. It has the people to manage that industrial base. And it is and has been receiving a lot of the outflow of investments from China into Mexico. So a lot of there, there's a lot of the Chinese companies were like, oh, you're going to tariff our cars or electric cars. We'll just build them in Mexico. That's a true thing that happened. Um, the U.S. Is, is is very much in a symbiotic relationship with Mexico, and anything that happens in Mexico has a, an effect in the U.S. That's very clear. Uh, with that being said, Mexico right now, as it is, uh, is is in a very antagonistical position with the against the United States, because we're seeing an uptake and growth in uh, populist leftist government in Mexico. They have no opposition. Well, this is something the U.S. and Americans have to be kind of clear-headed about. In Mexico, there's a single ruling leftist, pro-Chavez, pro-Venezuela, pro-Putin, pro-your enemies government, federal government that has no challengers. In this past election, I think they, they won by like a large enough mar margin. Like A lot of uh, former political parties had to be defunct, basically. So this is an this is this this federal government and just in general this culture that it's being developed around it is very anti-American. So this is what is growing in, in in Mexico and the U.S. is very much aware of this. Um, I think uh, we're about to have a new president being coming into power, uh, Claudia Chainbaum, a Jewish uh, um, a Jewish Mexican. Uh, leftist individual um, who is first female president of Mexico, uh, handpicked by the former president, uh, the, the outgoing president. 
and has a bit of a lot of radical uh, ideal ideas and, and belief. Uh, Rockefeller Foundation person, by the way, which is pretty kind of interesting. And also BlackRock sponsored. I don't want to go into conspiracies, but you could you could look into this yourself. It's really? pretty interesting. Yeah. So you have this you have this uh, political um, coldness and volatility against the United States down there. Basically, uh, they they invited Putin to the uh, to the inauguration of the of the of the of the incoming president, which is think about it. You know, Putin shows up to your to Mexico, which I don't think he's I don't think he's stupid enough to show up. But you know, you never know. That's crazy. Um, you have this again, this antagonistical thing going on with the current federal administration. Funny enough, they're pretty friendly with Trump, uh, at least as far as what, we, what, what, what in the past, the current president and Trump had a good relationship, apparently. He, he, uh, the current president calls him his friend. Um, but you, you, you see this hostility between both sides now. Um, you see a military that has clear plans on what happens if, uh, if an invasion happens with the U.S. They do have plans in place. And really? If if you talk to this, uh, uh, our, uh, the the contact you might have on with that wears a mask, he, he can talk to you clearly about some of this stuff. But they have clear orders to basically uh, empty out armories and meld into the civilian populace and go into guerrilla warfare fighting. And they have the capability of doing stuff like that. Here we um, go. You 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 have uh, clear indications that people like the new generation cartel will never go for any sort of deal with the United States. And they're going to be a completely antagonistical institution against the U S if they ever decide to invade or go after them in any direct, uh, conf confrontation. So, and also the fact that if the flow of fentanyl and drugs from Mexico closes off completely, let's say the U S does a something I envision them doing, which is a naval blockade on both sides of Mexico, inspecting anything anything that goes in and out of it. Um, and you see a, basically the pipeline of drugs cut off completely into the United States. I think you're going to see the effects of it in a few months. And it's going to dwarf whatever the COVID epidemic was as far as people going and going into withdrawals. I mean, it's going to be a massive health crisis in, in the U.S. if it happens. Interesting. Uh, which is something, again, I've heard about, talked about, you know, how, what if they start poisoning, poisoning drug loads? Uh, yeah, that's like a, a, it's like an internal way of destroying the country from the inside. Yeah. I mean, it's if, yeah, Mexico has a pretty, you know, doesn't have a military that can, can, can project, of course, but it does have a pretty experienced institution as far as the military as far as battle hardened and, and and knowing how to operate in its own territory um i'm not saying the u.s can't take them out in, in a few days but that's i don't know it's interesting yeah. um um the the u.s probably have, has never gone up against a country that has a lot of a citizenship living in the united states um and has a border with so it's, it's it would be a complex conflict uh are there plans and are there things out there that people are kind of thinking about? Yeah, they have been for a long time. I think something uh, after the uh, after the stuff that went on with the Fast and the Furious, yeah. I think specifically, I think that led a lot of uh, Amer uh, Mexican leadership into thinking about the U.S. as an antagonist more th more so than a friend, and and it's been a growing sentiment amongst Mexicans in general. Uh, as the viewing the U.S. as an antagonist. You say there's tension between our current administration and the Mexican administration currently, but they're both lean left. Why would that? Why would they not see eye to eye if they both are kind of leaning left in the political spectrum? Yeah. They, so you, this, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you see Mexico going woke, like we have gender pronouns on the books now. Uh, we have. Uh, whole uh, trans uh, rights uh, movement going on in Mexico. We have, it's going woke. Mexico, uh, it's going woke uh, as a whole, which is weird. Catholic traditional country. Right. Um, and you would, you would think that would match up with some ideal uh, idealism with the United States. Uh, but more powerful than all that, uh, Mexico is very much federally going the whole pro maduro pro putin pro like socialism capitalism uh uh communism almost yeah so 
in general, Mex the high level politics in Mexico are all about that, about supporting Cuba, about the fact that the embargo is a human rights violation, about the elections being fair in in Venezuela. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, this this is where the, me the the mentality is right now, and in all of those ways, the U.S. doesn't matter how woke or left you are, they don't fit that uh, narrative as a friend. So, um, wow. So we're the enemy no matter what. Even if we see eye to eye on a lot of the you know ideologies, we're still the enemy. Historically, historically, again, this and if you see the conversations had in Mexico about the U.S. and again, I'm. I'm a part of some of those conversations every now and then. It's uh, it's speaking of the pain that Mexico feels, discovering that most of the presidents in Mexico from the 60s, 70s, and 80s were on the CIA's payroll, and this is something that's all that's uh, some of the uh, declassified documents coming out of uh, the U.S. have told us now. Uh, so that leads to a lot of anger. In Mexico, uh, specifically when when the U.S. and Americans talk about this being a Mexican issue, that's our fault, and you should fix it. When the the hands of the U.S. in Mexico are very clear as far as how they've influenced and who they put in power and who they uh, made disappear and stuff like that in the past, and also their clear uh, participation in some of the inception or or um, the creation of some of these giant criminal enterprises that now operate on both sides of the border uh so this this is the sentiment that they the 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 uh the, the the political elites that are now in power in mexico are utilizing to further their uh agenda you know yeah. u.s is bad look at what they did here look at what they did there look at what they're doing to our friends and and, and compatriots in venezuela and in cuba and look at all the ways they've meddled in the past uh yeah. against us um, that's that's usually the argument that people take when when someone counters like my book or whatever is, is how America has kind of had their hands in a lot of these countries who helped destabilize a lot of the countries, but it's also almost the same viewpoint as what some of these extreme uh, Muslim countries that see us as the enemy as well. You know, right now, just from this conversation alone, it makes me really nervous to think about like who sees us in a good light because right now it doesn't feel like very many. I, I, it's a perception I get as well. I mean, I'm, I'm new to this country. Um, I have friends from all over. Um, I have I have a, a a very a very good friend of mine from Cuba. who's was a former Cuban military guy. He hates America with his with his whole heart. We're, we're, but our friendship uh, is stronger than that. But well, is, well, why uh, why is it same thing uh, that we meddled in any kind of corruption that that, that the the U.S. is basically after uh, maintaining its power under any means necessary, and it's uh, it's uh, embargo of Cuba, and it's uh, it's attempted at, it's multiple attempts at coups in, in in places like Venezuela, which are confirmed or not confirmed, who knows? Uh, and it's meddling in places that have a lot of lithium in South America are very suspect. Um, it's most of the places that have lithium in them are currently in some sort of strife, Mexico included. You know, mm. <laughs> um, so the, the, it's 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 a uh, it's their version of uh, I don't know. Uh, again, some of these things are true. The U.S. did have yeah, absolutely Mexican presidents who were on the uh, CIA's pay, uh, payroll. Some of them involved in mass killings of students and uh, putting down communist motivated uprisings in in in, in Mexico during the Olympics. Uh, so some of this stuff is true. I mean, Kiki Camarena was probably not killed by cartel members, uh, really? or at least not independent cartel members. Uh, probably some sort of CIA operation was going on around his, his, uh, subsequent murder and, uh, abduction and murder is, is that's a, that's an open, that's an open thing that gets talked about a lot in Mexico, how the uh, CIA was responsible for his murder. Um, wow. so you, you have this uh that's the sentiment cultural sentiment right now against the united states in not not everywhere uh, mind you this is just uh close to the ground um middle class lower middle class so there's no there's no middle class in mexico almost now um it's pretty polarized but basically that's kind of the sentiment that a lot of mexicans have uh, viewing the us as a suspicious enemy basically 
which is funny because the American dream is no longer in America. It's in Mexico. The amount of Americans moving to Mexico is insane. Um, Tijuana, for example, my hometown, 90% of all housing is being bought by Americans. <laughs> my dad has, well, all of my dad's neighbors are, are gringos. <laughs> deep one, which is fucking hilarious. Um, well, well, you know, if if Mexico feels deeply about that, why do we still have a big influx of immigration from Mexico? Because there's still uh, people that believe in the American dream. I don't. I don't think. I, so I. I think that's a, that's a false statement. I don't think you have a big influx of Mexicans moving into the U.S. I think it's been that's been on a downward trend. Yeah, uh, a lot of what you see now is Central American, which are, according to some of their sentiments, victims of regional destabilization provided by the United States that had made that made them have to leave, and uh, Venezuelans form a giant bulk of some of the new uh, immigration yeah. waves you're seeing in, the, in in the U.S. and some of them are being perceived very differently than some of the other immigration waves, like the Mexican uh, waves that went on in the. Uh, uh, 2000s and 90s, um, they're just a different type of immigrant. Um, and what are you seeing with them versus Mexico? I mean, Mexican immigrants would go to the the U.S. to work to send money money back to Mexico. Yeah, that was a phenomenon, and it still is. I mean, I'm not saying that we're out at zero as far as Mexicans crossing the border, but that's no longer a sentiment that you feel that much in Mexico yeah. of me going to seek a better life in the United States. That's not as common as it used to be. Um, now you're seeing Venezuelans coming through and they are all about the benefits, uh, some, not all of them, but the sentiment you get from them is yes. very different. They're not, they're not in the U S to work, to make a living, to send back home and to maybe create a home for themselves that they can retire to, which is kind of the me the generalized Mexican sentiment was, has always been. I'll make a life for myself and then I'll go back. And then, you know, with the cartel violence happening, that was no longer an option. So you started seeing people just stay. Um, it's just a different, it's, it's, it's a different motivations for these current waves. Most, most of these waves are now uh, mass migrations caused by regional destabilization and insecurity versus people looking for opportunities in the United States to make a better life for themselves and their families. I mean, I came to the U S and, uh, Immediately, I was like, hey, I just need to get to fucking work. Um, when I went out of the immigration uh, offices in San Diego, I was met with a bunch of uh, individuals uh, just showing me how much money I can get off the government if I went on all these programs. And I was like, yeah, dude, which one of these gives me a job? You know, uh, but that's that's the immigrant experience in the, in the, yeah. in the U.S. Um, so it's, it's very different from, you know, my my mother's generation, my grandmother's generation of coming across working and making a living. Uh, you're, you're correct. There's a lot of people looking for the benefits that the government now gives. Government money. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's like, uh, and again, I, I, I had to, I had to leave uh, for, for, for security reasons. Um, but the sentiment that I get, and I talk to a lot of immigrants um, on both sides of the border. And it's always like a thing uh, that I ask them is like, uh, are you going back? Uh, are you, are you staying? Um, what do you think? Uh, do you want a gun? You know, <laughs> these questions like that, you know, because, you know, th these, these perceptions that I've always, the worst enemy of a Mexican is another Mexican in the U S that's usually our worst enemies. And I've gotten a lot of criticism, criticism from people who are second, third generation, uh, sons of immigrants who don't even speak the language anymore. Uh, who are trying to tell me about the realities of the country that I just come, came from, <laughs> yeah. right? That I'm being too harsh and and and, and fear mongering with some of the stuff that I say about the country that I grew up in, you know? Yeah. Or that uh, that I'm I'm saying negative things about the current leftist president because I that because I lean to the right. Don't get me wrong, I don't like any of the former presidents of Mexico. They were all corrupt, and there's a reason why most of those records are hiding in Spain after they get out of office, right? I get a lot of criticism because I talk ill of the current administration and I talk ill of all of the past administrations. Uh, every single pres uh, the past two presidents that have left office are hiding in Spain right now. Felipe Calderón and Enrique Peña Nieto, both of them probably complicit in 
some sort of cartel influence in their administrations. And I worked under both of their administrations. Um, you have Martinez Luna, who was part of the Calderon administration, who is now under federal custody in the U.S. for clear cartel ties. Somebody was somebody was recognized and commended by the FBI, for example. I mean, he has all these commendations and stuff like that. And he's a cartel guy. So um, the the perception that as immigrants we that 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 we as immigrants uh, have with existing Mexicans or immigrants in the U.S. Uh, of our views. Um, you know, for me, coming to the U.S. was an opportunity. Um, it was also a privilege and more so than the the benefits that I was going to get. I was really excited about the responsibilities that I could have. Um, but that's not the case with people because uh, with some of the people that I've encountered up here, because they, they don't want responsibilities. They want benefits. Like, what do I get? Yeah. Um, for my injury, um, but I think I mean the, the the first things that a lot of the a lot of the first uh, people you know showing up to the U.S. will will tell you is that they're fleeing from something that they don't want to have repeated again, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, seeing um, seeing things like the uh, cancel the police type uh, events that happened in the past few years. Uh, was very familiar for somebody like me from Mexico, getting to experience. Yeah, if call nine one one, nobody's going to show up. Oh, I, I get that. I that's familiar to me and uh, as somebody from Mexico. Yeah. Uh, to to visit some of the police academies and seeing standards being lowered and, and classrooms being emptied because nobody wants to be a cop anymore. Yeah. That's fucking familiar to me. You know. Yeah, and I'm sure all the other people who come from other countries are seeing little hints of the beginning of what destroyed their country or what yeah. destroyed the economic I mean, position. If I say Mexican cop, everybody is immediately going to think about corruption, uh, shady. Like I get all that shit on me, although I never fucking took a dime from, from anybody. And I, and I have the receipts to prove it, but even, even that's the perception you get. Now, when you say police in the United States, what perception do you get in your mind? Yeah. The well, youth. Well, one, and that's, that's, a, that's a, that's a clear, yeah, that's a psychological operations campaign essentially that's happening to destroy the thoughts and the visions of of someone who who took a position to to protect and serve. Now, there's obviously some individuals who are not great at that job or never should have been in that job, but for the most part, the police uh, do take up a position that we should respect and we should actually feel safe around. Yeah, and just but, just the verbiage and and, and what's going on. Uh, it but actually, that, but yeah. The effects of it are recruitment is down. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, standards are lowered. Yep. And morale is low. Wants, morale is morale. low in the force. Nobody wants to do their job. Um, and also you have, again, omission is more of a thing. And uh, you have a youth that I, I every now and then I talk to some kids who are like, hey, what do you want to be when you... Nobody wants to be a cop because they grew up with none of their parents want them to be cops, right? None of their parents like, oh, I don't want to be a cop. You're like, wait, what's wrong with being a cop? Yeah, I mean that and the military and all these, all these institutions that have, you know, we we can talk about the reasons to go to war and them being justified or not, and some of the past conflicts being justified or not. Um, But the fact is that a lot of people that I know who are very very great Americans, a lot of the best Americans that I've met who taught me how to be a citizen of this, of this country all came from the military. <laughs> a lot of them crazy ass Marines for some weird fucking reason. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you, you, you have, you have a lot of these, a lot of that is going away now because they're vilified. Yeah. And, a, and, and if I know something about being vilified, because I was a cop in Mexico, I know what that is. I know what villainy is, you yeah. know, it doesn't matter how much you help somebody. It doesn't matter how much you do as far as work. Keep yourself clean. Keep yourself honest. It doesn't matter because the stigma is there. And it's yeah. cultural, historic. It shows up in movies. It shows up in jokes. And like I remember seeing this whole cancel the police process. I was around for the Portland riots. I was in, the, uh, I was in uh, Atlanta for some of the riots there. Uh, I was observing and kind of learning a few things about how shit goes on up here. Um, but it's familiar. It's complete. I was like, ah, they're doing the same shit here that they did down there. Yeah, corrode, corrode institutions. I, uh, you know, I worked in the Hollywood space. I still do. Right. But um, 
when people get to know who I am and my background, one of the questions I get all the time is like, why did you even serve in the military? And it blows my mind that they have one, the audacity to ask the question, but genuinely they don't understand what it means to kind of, or, or they're so disconnected to like serving the country, serving a purpose, you know what I mean? And, and, and how, how much pride I have in that, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't, I have pride in that. I have pride in my country. I have pride in serving. And then being Hispanic and being a border patrol agent. Oh, for them, it's just, it just blows their minds. For other Latinos in America, they go, why would you stop your own people? And <laughs> the conversation is just crazy. And like, <laughs> I, I've been attacked. I've been, I've had death threats. And from, from just writing this book alone, I realized when you said your own people kind of eat it, like the Latino community ate me alive for being a border patrol agent who is Hispanic. And I was just blown away by that. It's, uh, it's the cultural, it's the cultural victim of being a victim. Um, and I get it. I understand where some of this comes from and, and also some of my Latino community members. And, um, I mean, I've been told to, to, to say Latinx by some of them. And I, I said, ¿Qué vergas? Es eso? like, what the fuck is that? Uh, I get it. Uh, I've not only walked on the border and been through some of the migrant tra- caravans uh, camps on the Mexican side. I've also walked on the U.S. side and seen some of the work that the Border Patrol does. Um, and I've seen a lot of paisanos there. Like, you know, some of the like I've met this Absolutely. Border Patrol guy who I won't mention who is his name. But he's from Tijuana. This dude was from DJ. We were like looking at each other like, where are you from? Mexico. Like, where are you born? In Mexico. Like, where? Tijuana. What part? Like, we started fucking talking about skateboarding and shit. Like, we grew up in the same fucking place. Uh, this motherfucker was buying toothbrushes for kids with his own fucking money. And uh, while people were taking photo ops in these cages, you know, um, that w- that people were being put into, um. Uh, I would I would tell him like, dude, you want to see where we put people, we put immigrants in Mexico. <laughs> you want to see their experience down there. Um, I see and understand the confusion and the just lack of perception as far as like, hey, why would somebody, why would a Latino guy or a Mexican guy work for the Border Patrol? Uh, I, why would I go to work for the police? Well, one, I didn't have any fucking opportunities and I wanted to eat. So I had to go do something. So that was my reason for, for going in. So I didn't have a choice. There was that or go with the rest of my friends who were drug mules and most of them ended up dead. Well, that was my choice, right? I wasn't patri- patriotic about any of the stuff that I did. I was mostly about, okay, I guess I have to do this and, and let me get good at it or else I'll fucking die. Um, but when I saw what I, what I, what I, what I've been seeing as far as just the sentiment on both sides, uh, it's disheartening. Um, you see guys like him paying out of his pocket for fucking toothbrushes and this cartoon type fucking toothpaste thing that he bought just to make these fucking kids happy, uh, who were fucking probably went through a harrowing fucking experience of jumping on trains, jumping off trains, being fucking accosted by cartel members and police officers and who knows what the, those kids just went through. And he's paying for these toothbrushes from a gas station out of his pocket, handing them to these kids who are running over and like ripping them out of the sands. And somehow he's a villain and I should be angry at him. It doesn't make any fucking sense. For anybody that has those fucking perceptions, what have you done? Is usually what, what, what I'll ask, right? Where have you been? Um, the U S is one of the last places that allows us not only the opportunities, but the freedoms to pursue greater responsibilities. And that's what I've managed to find for myself. I came here running from a situation. Um, uh, my government down there fucking betrayed all of us. Basically they turned us into, uh, pariahs after fucking using us. Uh, for about 12 years. Um, and uh, I didn't get any severance package. <laughs> there was, uh, they still owe me money. Um, th- and here in the U.S., it's uh, 
I've gotten the responsibility of speaking about some of the people that I used to work with, my experiences, what's going on down there. And I've not only received a, an audience, but I also received the opportunity to go on uh, platforms like yours where I talk about some of these issues. Uh, and I do so from a place of responsibility because there's people still in risk down there and in the U.S. Um, I just went to uh, speak to a friend of mine who just lost his son um, from, from a fentanyl uh, overdose situation, uh, uh, pain medication. It's scary. That wasn't pain medication. So it's everywhere. And it's an issue, and um, the government uh, doesn't seem to want to do anything about it down south. And up here, it's it's also being not uh, not the best uh, at uh, kind of like curtailing some of these these issues. Uh, so that again, I, I take that responsibility with me, and I, I get it. I understand why some of these people are outraged. <laughs> Uh, but I also don't understand why some of them aren't doing anything about it. Why I don't see any of them at the border or I don't see any of them uh, kind of like investigating where their money goes to. Um, we would see people show up with a bunch of donations for the migrant caravans in Tijuana that would go through one door and then would go out through the other and, be, uh, and were sold on the open air market in, in places like Zona Norte. Uh, and that money was funneled back into the pockets of the organizers or some of the drug habits that, that came with them because a lot of these guys were 18th street gang members making their way into the U S. Yeah. Uh, so it's complex. A lot of these issues are very complex. Um, and it's scary where we're going. Yeah. I appreciate your time, man. I have one, one last question with the work that you're doing with the work that you did in, in how much you, you know about some of these cartels. Is there ever a fear uh, for your life? Have you been had death threats? Yeah, <laughs> I have. I've had many death threats. Uh, I had again. I left Mexico under uh, under uh, some pretty uh, dire situ uh, under a dire situation on my end. Um, I never speak about any, anything that isn't uh, known in some way, shape, or form. I never mention any names. Uh, I have contacts and people that send me information that are still out there working um i worry about it uh it's the reason why i call texas home <laughs> um so i mean if they want to show up to texas cool well and i have i have amazing friends um so yeah i worry about it constantly i do um i don't have a much of a family life uh i travel daily like i live my truth <laughs> I show people how to be clandestine ninjas, and that's usually what I basically live live off. Uh, so Airbnbs, hotels, and stuff like that is kind of like my thing. Um, to travel constantly, uh, but the the fear that I get mostly now is where we're headed. That's what keeps me up at night. You know, I'm uh, I'm in my forties, Mexican forties, which is about sixty. You know, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, I know, I know, I, I know, I, I don't have a lot of summers in front of me, but my, my kid does, yeah, and uh, my the kids of my friends do, and every now and then I see her, my kid, you know, playing with their kids, and they're all young, and I just think about what they're gonna get to see in their future, um, mm -hmm. and I see that giant black storm cloud coming in from the south, um. And again, I came here to flee a situation that I'm now seeing develop in the U.S. Scary. And there is definitely some sort of organized effort to corrode institutions here. And I know where we're headed, I know where we're headed because it, it's beginning to feel a lot more like home. <laughs> Man, that's heavy. Where can others who watch this podcast potentially hire you to learn more from you so they can hopefully gain access to your information. Sure. Uh, you can reach out at www.edsmanifesto.com. We run training for government and private and public classes across the country. I'll show you how to get out of hairy situations and, 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 and scary places. That's kind of what I focus on. Um, I also do a lot of uh, public speaking related to mental health, uh, cartel and border issues and just the immigrant experience. That's kind of what I focus on now. Um, 
And uh, if you can, if you can get to one of those classes out there, we I'll show you some things. <laughs> Honestly, such <laughs> such an incredible podcast, man. Um, I had questions I never even had to touch them because the conversation flowed and your 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 experience, your knowledge, and what you currently go through daily, uh, I think, is such a powerful message for the audience to learn, to hear, to hopefully understand and. Uh, this was an incredible interview, man. And I hope you come back again for another one soon. Thank you. Uh, got your book. I'm not all, the, I'm not all the way through it. Uh, I have a stack of them next to me and I have to go through all of them. So, but I, I'm, I'm doing it. Uh, I appreciate you. I appreciate the invitation. I get the vilification aspect of it and the frustration that that creates in some of us uh, because we had to do a job that nobody else want, wanted to or could do. Um, and I get the aspect of now being in the public space and now trying to provide a bit of context to some of that work and help others that are still in it. So I appreciate you for that. Thank you, brother. Thank you for listening to the Borderland podcast and the Ironclad original. Don't forget to share with your friends and let them know. See you next week. Mm-hmm.